Cool. Um, I think we'll get started, and if anybody wanders in, we'll make it in. Awesome. Uh, first off, thanks everybody for coming to Develop Denver. Uh, I'm one of the organizers, and I hope you all had a good day so far. Um, so I'm the last talk at this venue, and then there's a opening happy hour at the building next door. Um, so you're in the right place. Um, so you're here for Achieving Happiness, How to Create a Successful Freelance Business. Hopefully everybody's here for that talk. Awesome. I am Michael Deasing, as the board says. Um, I am a product designer and freelancer. I've been primarily freelancing for the last six years. Um, so I just uh, wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about how I have made that work. Um, so for starters, um, who in the room is currently a freelancer? Raise your hand. Awesome. And any aspiring freelancers or people that want to do freelance work? Awesome. Sweet. Well, hopefully this talk will help you with that. Um, so, I mean, we all kind of want to live that freelance life that people talk about, where you work 20 hours a week and spend the other 60, 70 hours a week up in the mountains, snowboarding, skiing, hanging out. <laughs> just going wherever you want in the middle of the day, doing whatever you want to do, only answering to yourself and no one else telling you what to do. Um, yeah, so that's that's the ideal life. Sometimes it works out that way, sometimes it doesn't. Um, there's, there's a lot to be done and a lot to be said. Um, the, one of the things I want to bring up is that hard work is hard. Um, being a freelancer is awesome, there's a lot of benefits, but there's also a lot of things that you have to deal with that you may or may not have wanted to. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of backstory on how I got to where I am and what shaped my career. Um, so yeah, I started out moving out here to Colorado quite a long time ago after college. Basically, I graduated college, I'm from Iowa, and said I have to find a job somewhere, and I don't want to do it here. So I headed west, hit the mountains, and never made it over the other side. Um, when I got a job, just to give you a little context to the time period, um, I actually broke out the phone book and sat down in a coffee shop and flipped through and looked up advertising and found every advertising agency and called them and went to their door and said, hey, can I talk to somebody? Um, that's how I got the job starting out. Um, I, it took me nine months to get a job when I first started, um, which was a lot of hard work, and I think that helped me figure out the hard work of being a freelancer. Um, yeah, when I started, I worked at Target, Kinko's, um, I worked at a local printer shop, I was also a server, the, literally the worst server you've ever had at any restaurant. <laughs> um, and I was doing freelance design on the side to try and get into the industry. Um, so I spent six years in the advertising industry. Um, I worked at some places that I worked on some products you know, to get name recognition, worked on some big brands. Um, one of the shops I worked at here in town is called Integer. They're still around. Um, I worked there for a real long time, mostly on Procter & Gamble products, Bounty, Charmin, Pampers. Um, if you really want to live a good life, work 60 hours a week on toilet paper campaigns. Awesome. Um, I worked at Gillette there too and some other things. That led me into more and more digital work. Um, and then when I left there, I went to a small shop because I thought things would be totally different in a small shop than they were in a big shop. They weren't. Um, and learned how to do responsive web design. Um, I did a ton of travel and tourism websites. I think I did six or seven travel and tourism websites in one year uh, while I was there. And then, um, yeah, uh, from there, I actually got fired. And it was probably the best thing that happened to me for my career. Um, because when I was in college, I thought I wanted to be in the advertising industry, thought that was the life I wanted to live. Lived it for six years, um, thought things were different in a small agency, um, 
things were awesome for a while, business changed, they fired me, um, and I went home and said, what the hell am I doing with my life? Do I even want to be doing this? Um, and that gave me an opportunity to really push into stuff I was passionate about. Um, so, I mean, that's one thing I would say, breaking into freelancing, like take your passions and look for projects that allow you to explore your passions. Um, um, spent a lot of time looking for work and figuring things out. When I first started out in freelancing, uh, it was a stopgap between jobs. And I was like, I'll just do some side projects while I'm looking for a full-time game. Uh, side projects turned into more work than I could handle and more business than I, I realized. Large part of that is due to networking. So um, there's a million ways to network. Um, I probably spent way too much time at meetups. Um, I would sometimes go to three meetups in one day. Um, and just meet as many people as possible. The bigger your network, the more possible that somebody's going to think of you and give you some business. Um, I basically, my wife thought I was a professional drinker. I would just go to like happy hours, like three or four days a week, um, and like ten in a month. Um, and I found out really quickly the ones that worked out for me. Um, one of the big things is just. Get some business cards printed, even if it's just your name and your email, it doesn't need to be fancy, and hand them to literally every person you meet. Like, if you meet somebody for two seconds, they should not walk away from you without a business card. Um, sounds stupid, and you go through a lot, but you'd be surprised how many of those business cards come back around to business three months, six months later, um, and not even from the people you handed it to from a friend of theirs, or somebody who asked them if they knew anybody, and you're the only person they know. Perfect. Um, that's also my advice when it comes to meetups and networking and stuff. Don't exclusively go to meetups and networking for your industry or people that do the same thing you do. You'll get some business, some referral business from people that have too much business and, and are passing it off to other people. But um, as a designer, one of the main things that I found is when I went to developer meetups, I got 10 times more business because I'm the only designer that that developer knows. Um, and that was huge. I went to conferences about development and ended up meeting a lot of people. And that's how I actually got involved with this. Um, five years ago, I came to Develop Denver because a friend of mine founded it and met a ton of developers and got a ton of business out of it and it was one of the best things I did, and I was incredibly poor when I came to this. Um, I actually, the same year, I decided to pull a bunch of money from my savings and go to South by Southwest and spend way too much money um, to get there and get a hotel and everything. Um, but I learned so much about the tech industry and more about like what facets of it I actually wanted to work in and what things made me excited. Um, and those are the projects that I, I seek out. So um, networking is definitely a big part of that. Uh, one part of that too is when you meet somebody who's cool and you're like, hey, you do awesome work, I wanna talk to you more, just ask them if you can sit down with them with coffee or over a drink or buy them lunch sometime um, and pick their brain and hear about what they do. Um, one of the biggest things with networking and this sort of business is it will inevitably come back around to you, make it about them. So learn as much as you can about what they do, ask them about their projects, what inspires them, how they got to where they are, and inevitably it will come back around to you and what you're looking to do and what your passions are. But it's not, hey, give me a job. Hey, I want your money. I, I really like need work right now. I'm dying. Like, don't be desperate, um, even if you are. Um, always, always project confidence, even though you might be dying inside. <laughs> um, so I want to take a minute with the networking theme here, and why don't you guys introduce yourselves to someone around you that you don't know previously, 
um, and give them your one-liner. So the example I have is, uh, so I'm Michael Dusing. I'm a product designer. I make mobile and native apps. You need a one-liner when you talk to people because you may just meet them for two seconds and they need something to latch onto and take away. So why don't you guys take a minute and introduce yourselves to somebody around here. So hopefully you just met some people you know and learned that they do stuff that you don't do. So yeah, any way you can extend your network, and that includes you know keeping track of other people that do things. Um, as a freelancer, inevitably a client or a prospect will ask you if you do what you do plus something else, and rather than saying no, just say yes to everything, <laughs> literally everything. Um, I'll talk about that a little more in a minute. So yeah, it's literally that simple. Just have a one-liner, say your name, say what you do, and that way somebody has something to take away. And that might be your entire conversation with someone. But if they have your card and remember that little tidbit, they will contact you again, I promise. Might take a while, but it comes back around. You have to be patient. Um, I don't have a slide that says that. That's a big, big part of things, being patient. Um, so one of the things, there we go. Um, so a big part of this too is that it's a business and sometimes things suck. Some things are not fun to do and you're not gonna to wanna to do them. And that freelancer life that you dreamed of, you're gonna be like, what the hell am I doing in an Excel spreadsheet figuring out my expenses for the month? It's, it's worthwhile in the end, there's that stuff and you'll learn really quickly the stuff you hate and the stuff you just can't do that you need people to do. I know plenty of freelancers that have bookkeepers. Um, I hire a CPA because taxes are just stupid and hiring a CPA got me actually way more money back in business expenses because they know tax law and you do not. And unless you want to read a giant tax law book about small businesses, um, which you could do, um, they, will, they will figure out lots of things for you. So, um, I mean, there's a lots of things to get started with a business. If you're gonna take it seriously and start to have lots of clients, you probably wanna form an LLC um, or an S Corp. There's benefits to both things. That's where like accountants and CPAs can help you figure out what's right for you. Um, I do not pretend to be an expert in that at all. Um, also, uh, you may need to get insurance for some clients. Um, I've had a couple of contract jobs where they need um, like basically errors and omissions insurance. Um, so you may need to do that. That's not fun to do. It's not fun to pay for. Charge it back to the client, mark it up a little bit. Um, make, sh <laughs> make, sure, make sure you, uh, you they get what they pay for and you get what you, all your, your time and all of your expenses get built with a client. Um, if they're not paying you, you can you can do mileage. So like driving down here and driving home, that's mileage, that's a business <coughs> expense. You came to a conference and learns things. Um, your ticket to this is a business expense. Stuff like that. Um, also a big part of a business is contracts. So um, some clients may give you a giant contract to sign and you're like, oh God, what am I getting into? Um, read it through, make sure it works for you, sign that thing. If clients don't give you contracts, I like to have a general contract that I use for my clients and offer it up to them before they offer me theirs. If you sign theirs, you could also have them sign yours. Um, generally, I work um, with a lot of people more than once, even people that are like, oh, it's just a 10 hour job this week, don't worry about it. Um, I have them sign my master services agreement and then I have statements of work that are just the quick like, I'm doing an email campaign for you, I'm doing a landing page, uh, I'm designing this one feature of your app. Um, and the statement of work is just about that one thing, the master services agreement is really what covers you so that if things go crazy, um, you don't have to worry about it. 
Um, I luckily knock on wood have not had to take anything to court or had anybody take me to court, but I have gotten close a couple times, which has been not fun. Um, so having those things, even if you think somebody's your best bud and really is a great person to work with, is a is a good thing to have. Um, and there's templates out there on the web. Um, I will try and post a template as well um, on my Twitter probably. Um, the other thing about like, you know, like, do I really need a contract? Somebody just needs something. It actually makes you look way more professional um, to have that stuff, especially um, when you bring it up and they don't bring it up. Um, it can also help you time after time to get more business. Um, when you use contracts with people, they will refer you to other people and say like, this person is really professional, you should work with them. Um, it just makes everybody look good uh, and protects you. So do that if you can. Um, be smart, plan ahead. Uh, so financial stuff is always fun. Everybody wants to make lots of money. Um, it's great when you're rolling in freelance work and you're rolling in dough. Make sure to set aside a little bit for Uncle Sam. Um, I set aside 30% of everything I make um, for tax stuff. Um, generally, you're not gonna need that much for taxes, but it definitely helps. Um, and if everything goes to crap, you have some money that you might need for one month of rent um, to keep a roof over your head. Um, plan for the downtime, seasonal work, budgeting, um, in general if you can make enough money that you set aside like a month or two, that stuff helps. There's, there is seasonality to what you're doing a little bit. Um, November, December right now, like that we're starting a little bit of a downtime. Um, people's budgets, a lot of people's budgets renew in January, and so they're like, yeah, we have a bunch of work, we can't wait to work with you, but not for two months. And you're like, awesome, I still have rent and dog food to pay for, <laughs> so please help me out. Um, do what you can to plan for that. Um, there's also seasonality like July. Um, there's some people do it on the fiscal year in July 1, so just plan for that stuff. Um, one of my big pieces of advice is fake it till you make it. Um, I was talking about like if somebody asks for something that you don't do and you want that business, just say yes. It'll, it'll all work out. It's fine. <laughs> you'll find somebody, like you'll either learn how to do it or you'll find somebody who can do it for you and then you subcontract them and you mark up their rate a little bit and you just made some money on somebody else's time. Um, I actually, the first iOS app I ever did, I went, a friend of mine had someone that, at their company that was shooting off a startup and doing an iOS app. Um, and they were like, hey, can you do an iOS app? And I was like, yeah, I use apps. I can design this. <laughs> um, and I actually sat down with them and they're like, hey, we've been quoting this with like these big companies and we're getting astronomical numbers. Like, can you make an app for this budget price? And I was like, sure, probably. Yeah, I could do that. Um, but what I ended up doing was selling them on spending two days figuring out their product plan because their plan was like, hey, here's one sentence, we wanna make an app that does that. Um, and so we spent two days, figured out like, you know, why do they wanna make an app that does that? And does anybody wanna use that at all? Um, and we, we did a little bit of like discovery and then we actually went out and kinda canvassed and just talked to people around town and said, would you use this? Are you looking for this? What what do you care about about it or not, um, you know, it's a startup. They had like a list of like a hundred things that it had to have to do. Um, and we whittled that down to like 10 things that it should do that people actually would use. Um, and that was like, got like 1% of what people had quoted them for the app. And so they were much more receptive to like, let's spend the time to do that and figure out a plan. And then from there, they were like, okay, cool. Now that we figured this out together, can you help us build it? I'm like, yeah, no problem. 
I don't code iOS. Uh, you need a website. I don't have a front end person. Oh, you need a database architect. I don't have that person at all. Um, I can't do that. So I went out and found three people to do the, that work. Um, and I managed those people because the startup folks had zero tech knowledge and, and just didn't know what to look for. So I helped them hire those people. I managed those people and worked on that project for three years off and on. Um, and worked up their rates so that I made money. Um, but it was, it was awesome. And I learned a ton and I got great work out of it. It was totally worth it. So yeah, fake it till you make it. The other end of that spectrum is fail a lot. So there were a lot of things that I didn't know how to do that I said I could do, and I did not deliver on. Um, it's gonna happen. Um, you do stuff, you try it, it doesn't work at all like you thought, you adapt, you learn, you move on. Um, there's clients that it sound like amazing clients, and you do two weeks worth of work for you, for them, and then they're calling you every 10 minutes for changes. And you're like, dude, you are way more needy than the rate that you're paying me. So I'm not going to do business with you anymore. Um, don't be afraid to fire clients. Um, they will fire you. If it suits them, you can fire them. Um, money is great, but not at the cost of your happiness. That's the whole point here, is being happy and doing what you want to do. Um, I'm going to do it on time. OK. Um, yeah, so I mean, don't be afraid to take risks, pitch bigger, bigger projects, um, you know, do things outside of your spectrum a little bit. Um, one of the biggest parts here too for me is that I learned so many skills freelancing that I would not have learned in one position at a company long term. So I mentioned that I spent six years at an advertising agency. I realized at the end of that that my portfolio, my project work at the end of my career there was literally the same stuff I did two months ago. And I had nothing to show for six years of stuff. Yeah, it was more polished, but on paper, on a resume, it's like, hey, you did the same job for six years. Great, awesome, you have one skill. Um, freelancing, you, you have to do a lot of things. Even just managing other people, managing your business, managing finances, giving presentations, writing proposals, like you have to adapt. Um, and that's what a lot of people want. Um, communication adapting, uh, adapting different skills. I learned HTML and CSS because my clients needed it. I had no idea what I was doing and was very clear with them. I mean, be honest with your clients. Like if they say, hey, can you code this email campaign that we need it in three weeks? And you're like, yeah, I can figure that out. I don't know how to do that right now, but I'll figure it out for you. They're like, sweet, awesome, taken care of. Um, you know, and then like a week and a half in, if it's not working for you, you're not figuring it out, you find a friend to help you, or you tell them, hey, it's not working out, I need somebody to help me out. Um, but be much more receptive to that than, hey, I can do that. And three weeks later, they ask for it to be delivered, and you're like, yeah. Last night at midnight, I started that for you, and it just did not work out. <laughs> um, that's not good. That's a failure. But you learn from it. Um, so you can move it on. Um, yeah, it, basically, freelancing helps you have a diverse set of skills, and you are much, much more valuable to anyone you do work for. Um, I am going to show you a quick thing of my work, or lack thereof. So when you're freelancing, you often don't have time to work on your portfolio. Um, so when things slow down, you work on it. If you stay busy all the time, I've been reasonably busy for the last three years. This is my homepage of my website right now. It says case studies are coming soon. That's been up there for a year and a half. Um, it generally helps me get business, actually. Um, I do have one case study that I built a little bit, and I will talk about it real briefly, um, and then I want to leave time for Q&A so that you guys can ask questions. Um, so this is a case study for an app 
program that I built. Um, I was fortunate enough to work at Gaim when they had the Yoga Studio app, um, and we did a campaign with Apple directly. Um, that was awesome. I got that gig from doing an email campaign for one day at Gaim TV, which is a partner company of theirs. I did that campaign, went into their office twice, and ended up with a um, contract gig for six months doing UX design on that product. And then when that contract gig ended, somebody else that I met in the lunchroom one day gave me a job doing iOS work. Um, so it was just totally like happenstance. One two day gig turned into a year and a half of working on apps. Uh, so small things can grow. Uh, but we did a campaign with Apple. They did a, something called Apps for Earth where they had a bunch of different apps that when you purchase them, all the money went to the World Wildlife Fund. Um, and Yoga Studio kind of fit into that. Um, so we did a whole campaign. Um, I won't bore you with the huge details, but essentially we altered the branding of the app to fit into the campaign. Um, used a lot of nature imagery, which was very different for this app. It was all just white background, person in, in yoga clothing, um, very clean. Um, and so we integrated all their branding. We added new content specifically for Earth Day. So, you know, yoga tree stuff. Um, I don't know if you guys are into that, but I learned a lot about yoga. I definitely did not do yoga before this. Did a little bit during, haven't done a lot since. Um, but yeah, here's some of the screens. So we had things popped up for um, new users or current users. Um, there were a couple of collections that were specific to the earth thing. Photography was very different. Um, so we found a way to integrate that. We also integrated some meditation. Um, and some nature photography there. So providing new content was a big thing that Apple wanted us to do. And we were like, what do we have in the can that we can put in the app in three weeks? Um, this, this whole campaign was done in five weeks, which was insane. Um, we had just launched on Apple TV like a month before they asked us to do this. Um, and so we made all this integrated into Apple TV, which at the time was, uh, Apple TV apps had just come out about three months before that. Um, so it was a little bit of the wild west, but one of those things where we were like, sure, we can do that. It'll be a lot of sales and a lot of exposure. Um, so we made some beautiful things on the TV, which was awesome with this nature photography. We were able to highlight it. Um, this is the whole execution window. I won't bore you with that stuff, but basically we got featured on the homepage of the App Store. We put stuff up on our website. Um, I led all this um, and worked through things. The results of this campaign were that our app alone raised $110,000 for a World Wildlife Fund um, over a period of 10 days. So it was pretty awesome. So yeah, um, that's a little bit of my work. I do want to open up to questions for you guys. Two real quick things. I do a podcast um, on UX with two other people, Kyle Coberly, who most of you may know. Um, he helped out with this conference as well. Um, and Emily McCammon is one of our co-hosts. Um, we do a weekly podcast on UX. Um, check it out, it's called Sprint. Um, and also tonight is Develop Happy Hour that is partnered with the opening happy hour next door at the source. Um, we do that happy hour monthly. It actually spawned out of this conference. People meeting here and us saying, hey, we work in the same city. We never see each other throughout the year. Let's meet up once a month. So there were like three of us who did that for a year and a half. And now it's like 150 people every month. So come check it out. Great place to network. Um, yeah, so does anybody have any questions about freelancing? Or anything really? Here, I'll give you the mic so that we can all hear you. Hi, I'm just curious about some of these sites. <coughs> like Upwork and FireRR, have you used any of those? I'm, I'm asking because I'm curious about them, but 
I'm kind of scared of becoming a commodity, and I'd like to avoid the whole commodity thing. I don't feel it's gotcha. Um, yeah, so Upwork, all those 99 designs, things like that. Um, I personally stay away from all of that stuff. Um, the value that you have to the market is the value that you believe in yourself. So if you're willing to do spec work for people or free work, then that's the bar that you just set in their head, is that you can do free work. They don't have to pay you. Um, it's so hard to go up from anything, and especially when you're doing really low level work like that. You spend a lot more of your time doing that sort of work and getting less payout in the end than you do if you land one solid client at a real rate. Um, so in my opinion, I just totally ignore all that stuff. So I love your presentation. The one part that I personally have a problem with is the fail, especially with clients. Um, it just, maybe, I, I don't know, if you could talk about how you deal with that. <laughs> I, I, by the way, when I'm working on teams with other people within processes, I think failing, failing fast and failing forward is absolutely the best thing you can do. How you do that with clients, wow, that, that, that's a hard one for me. And go ahead. So yeah, failure is definitely a challenge. Um, my point there is more like you're gonna fail and it's okay to fail. You're taking a lot of risk by saying, you know, I solely can solve all of your problems. And sometimes it's not gonna work out. And if it ends, it ends and it's rough and it's like, oh man, that was a sweet gig that I just totally screwed up. And you move on and you get another client and you learn from it. Um, it's okay, it's gonna happen. Yes, you wanna to try to avoid it as much as possible. Right. You're still here. And I'm still here. Right. Sure. How do you think about pricing projects, be it like rates or value-based or otherwise? Oh, that was such a magic question. Um, I have my own opinions. I got absolutely screwed on a value-based project, so now I stay away from that. Um, I know other people, that's all they do, and they love it, and it works out fine for them. You really have to figure out what's good for you. Um, I do, depending on the scope of the project and depending on how long it is, I do detailed estimates of, generally it's broken down into hours, um, and that can then turn into a project rate where you get 50% up front and they pay the rest in stages. Um, or it could be an hourly thing where they pay you on a cadence of a week or two weeks. It all depends on the length of stuff. Um, it's That's really hard to answer. It's really different for every project. Um, like I said, I've, I've had issues in the past. One of the things I learned was always take money up front. Um, even if it's 30%, I try to do 50%. You'd be surprised how many people you weed out that just weren't serious about the work. And make sure you hold on to the property. So like when I design stuff to pe for people, I don't send it to the printer or um, give them the digital files or anything like that until the invoice is out and it's paid. Um, which is hard, and it's easier with clients that you do continual business with um, to set a cadence and you know, can be like, okay, I gave you an invoice, I know it's in your system, I know it's going to get paid in two weeks. Um, I generally invoice on 15 days, um, and most people don't have a problem with that, especially if you just draw a line in the sand and say, that's the way I work. Um, digital stuff is hard because you can give somebody an app, and they're like, oh, we pay on a 30-day cycle. And you're like, cool, I just gave you everything. So 30 days from now, I just hope a check shows up. Um, so hope that answers your question. May I ask? Uh, if you have like a longer-term project, how do you deal with 
<clears throat> like timing, like are you still going after it all the time, trying to get business regardless of kind of like your workload and how do you manage that? Um, yeah, like do you encourage just kind of getting as much as you can or do you time it out somehow? So that's part of the like pacing and planning ahead. Um, it's hard because sometimes you're like, oh man, I have no business, I need everything. And you'll have like 10 bids out and all of a sudden they all want you to do the work and you're like, uh, crap. Uh, in the next month I cannot do 10 projects all at the same time. Um, and that's where your network comes in. You might have somebody who you subcontract some work to. Um, you know, something that's easy or a portion of a project to get it moving while you do stuff. Um, don't kill yourself. I mean, money's great and maybe you spend a month where you work 90 hour weeks every week, but then you spend the next month like not doing that. <laughs> Working 20 hour weeks. Um, so you really have to pace yourself. I know freelancers who just totally burned themselves out because they couldn't say no to stuff. Um, and felt pressured um, and worked 90 hour weeks for six months and basically made like their salary and a half from the previous year, but at the cost of their like mental health and like physical health. Um, so you really have to keep tabs on that. Um, I mean, it ebbs and flows. It's easy to be like, this gig is awesome. I don't need to look for work. Um, I mean, I try to have a couple of regular things that I go to and always be like talking to people and handing out cards. Who knows, man? Somebody might offer you your dream job while you're in the middle of a pretty decent gig and you just didn't know it was out there because you didn't pay attention. So, the, the subcontracting suck? I haven't done that at all. Like subcontracting that. can suck. I have totally subcontracted stuff to people that um, said they do the work and two days before I'm like, hey, I want to see that and make sure it's good before I send it to my client. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm not going to be able to do that for you. I'm like, sweet, well I subcontracted it to you because I don't have time and now I'm just not going to sleep for the next 48 hours. So that sucks hard. Um, I've also, on huge projects where I hired developers and stuff, I made them sign contracts, um, same stuff that I did, like, these are deliverables, this is the schedule, like, if you don't deliver on this, you're fired and I'm gonna have to find somebody else, and I probably can't, but I'm not gonna tell you that. Um, yeah, it all works out good. Uh, why don't we take one from this side? So, since you said that you tend to go hourly, then charge for those instances where it's something that you don't know how to do and you decide to learn how to do it yourself? So yeah, when I don't know how to do something, that's where um, being honest with the client can be good for you. Um, so I can be like, yeah, I can do that for you. It's gonna take me longer than somebody that does that every day, but I'll get it done for you in the time period that you need. And sometimes they'll be like, yeah, that's great. I don't care, as long as it gets done. And other times they'll be like, oh, we'll just find somebody who does that. And that's also where your network comes in. You can be like, I know somebody who does that. Here's their name. You can use them. Or if you want, I can talk to them and see if they can get that work done for you. Um, don't be afraid to do that as well. If you want to learn something, um, you can say like, hey, I have an interest in that and I can do it for you and I'll charge you at a lower rate or I won't charge you for the hours that I'm just learning it. Like, that's totally up to you. I mean, you, you make your, your money the way you make it. Um, it. Also, I mean, I've had clients that are like, great, if you want to learn that and do it, as long as it gets done, I don't care, charge me for all the hours you spend. And that's awesome when somebody's paying you to learn new stuff. So, inevitably you're not gonna know how to solve everything at every point, so you're gonna be learning some stuff on somebody's time. So, uh, I'm over here. So when you don't have clients, you have a drive spell, uh, how do you find new clients and uh, 
also, what is your process for putting in a proposal? And how detailed of a breakdown do you get for that? Like, is it here's how many hours I do for each individual thing, or is this is you know this whole project going to take X amount of hours, or how do you kind of break down um, the specifics? So yeah, the first part of that question about um, like how do I deal with the dry spell and stuff, um, I actually took four months off when my son was born and then went back to work and all of my clients basically found somebody else in those four months to do stuff. And I was like, hey, I'm here, I'm back, give me your money. And they were like, no, we're good. We don't need anything. Um, so stay in touch with people as much as you can. Um, the, some of those people actually ended up coming back to me a couple months later. Um, but dry spells are hard. Uh, I mean, networking is a big part of it. Also, I mean, like, put the word out there to all your friends that, hey, I'm looking for work and this is what I do. Um, I've actually found a reasonably okay uh, success with LinkedIn, where your description literally starts with currently seeking um, consulting gigs or currently seeking gigs um, in all caps um, the recruiters <laughs> love that um, but yeah that that helps a little bit um, and just a little bit of uh, proposals and the process and things it does depend a lot on the project and the scope of the project if it's a project that you think is going to take more than a month you probably need to stage it out a little bit the grand scheme of things, what your client really cares about is that number at the bottom of your proposal that says this is how much you owe me at the end of this. Um, I often do ranges um, for things like subdivide it as much as you can and as accurately as you can. Um, like I, I generally break things down into like four or five stages depending on the project. And then within those, there's bullet points of these are the things that need to be done. Each one of those has a range of hours. And so each stage has a range of hours. And then the project has a range of hours. The awesome explanation is like, when you're like, hey, this project is going to be anywhere from four grand to like 15 grand, depending on how much you get crazy. Um, <laughs> software is hard, because there's always stuff that comes up that always pivots. Um, Oftentimes, I'll do a proposal for everything they ask for, and then a proposal for, here's the stuff you, I think you really need to need to do uh, first, and get that out there. You know, it's the iterative approach. Like, here's a product that works, and somebody can use it for the things that they care about. Here's all those extra features that are great, and will make your product better, but not needed day one for someone to use. Um, hopefully that helps. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? So on the topic of subcontractors, um, you mentioned kind of you had maybe like a little bit of a couple scenarios that didn't turn out so well. Um, when you're vetting for these people, have you found a process or something that works for you lately uh, when you're expanding? outside of your scope of what you can really do. So yeah, um, finding subcontractors and vetting them is hard. Um, a lot of times it's friends of friends um, or people that I met that I've seen their work and I think they can get stuff done. The big thing freelancing, hiring other freelancers is like, I need you to do that work because I can't and I'm kind of screwed if you don't. So it's mostly based on my level of confidence that they can deliver. Um, because you're putting your reputation on the line for them, and you may or may not have done work with them. So having some people that you can continue to go back to is good. Um, I mean, a lot of the small agencies and small design shops in town, that's how they start. Just a bunch of people who trade work. Um, so yeah, it's based on confidence a lot of the time, and vetting is based on your friends' recommendations. But like I said, sometimes people sound awesome and don't turn out to be that. I mean, that's just part of the business too. Everything is risk and reward. Uh, one over here. I just 
just had something to add or a potential tip on something you mentioned about timing of projects. Usually projects have certain points where you need to get something from the client, like content. So that's something that I used to do um, would be to kind of time in. If you have multiple things, figure out, okay, if I can get this one to this point, I can send that back to the client and say, hey, I need you to do this now. And sometimes people take a really long time to get stuff done. So that can kind of buy you time to finish other things. And then if things get slow, you can bug them and try to get them to hurry up. Is that something that you do? And then I guess one question on that is, um, how do you put timing into contracts? Do you usually try to leave that open-ended or estimates based on, hey, if you're quick, this is how quick I can get it done? So yeah, you bring up a really good point. Um, often with digital stuff, one of the biggest issues is content and getting things from, because they're all like, make this, make this, make this. And they're like, okay, now it needs stuff to put into it or I need a logo from you. And they're like, yeah, I'll get that to you next week. And you're like, this is all hurry up craziness, and now you're just gonna chill for a week. Um, that is a good way to like find new business in those drop downs. Um, it, oftentimes you'll quote a project and it's gonna take three weeks, and then the client doesn't get it back to you, and your project now is six weeks long, and you lined up another gig to start after the first gig. Um, so yeah, being honest with your availability is good too. It's like, hey, I have three days this week that I plan to work on your project and I need this or I'm not going to spend any of those days on your project. Um, I have a couple of clients that are notorious for like hurry up and wait. Um, and they still pay me well, things still work out well, but every project that should take two weeks takes a month and a half, and now I just know that. Um, and I plan around that. And um, I'm like, there's gonna be a time, and inevitably when they give me stuff, it's always when I'm like busy with something else. Um, but that that's, you plan for that as much as you can. Um, and those repeat customers, you can you can figure that out pretty quickly. Um, who's going to get you something right when you ask for it on the same day, and who's going to take three days, and then you figure out the cadence of like, okay, I need to ask for this three days before I actually need it because they're not going to read this email, or they're not going to send it to me, or they need to get it from somebody else. Um, so, yeah, does that answer your? Anybody else? Yeah, sure. Go for it. And then we'll work our way back. All right. So, uh, listen to all this. This is great info and great exchange. I'm wondering, is there anything specific to freelancers to network within the, the conference framework? Like, for example, you know, I, I have a great app that I use for generating proposals that turn into invoices, and, but I'd love to find a good CPA things like that that are not necessarily about this finding gigs as much as they are about how do you be successful with this as a network. Um, so there isn't anything direct towards that as part of Develop Denver this year. There's a lot of career focused stuff. Um, I will say that the Denver Dev Slack group has been a huge help as well as like I'm a UXer so Denver UX Slack group has been a huge help. There's a work from home thing in there and some of us go get lunch occasionally because when you're a freelancer and you get cabin fever and need to get out. Um, I mean, meetup, there's business meetups, there's other meetups sometimes that work for that. Um, you can start your own thing too. Yeah. Um, I mean, definitely, I ask other freelancers all the time, like, hey, I'm dealing with this situation, what would you do? Have any advice? Oh man, I need a CPA. My CPA is actually just quitting doing side CPA work, so now I need a new one. Um, so that's always fun. Um, finding CPAs is the worst thing. It's so hard. But once you get a good one, you latch on and you don't let go. <laughs> um, two more quick questions in the back. Thanks. Uh, I'll make it quick. Do you ever miss like the normal day-to-day -day grind in like a typical job, or do you think freelancing is like your long-term future? And I don't know. Do you have any other recommendations for people that are kind of between the two? Um, so the short answer to that is yeah. Sometimes I do. Um, I'm actually quite a social person. 
um, and I go crazy when it's just me, my wife, and my dog, and my kid. Um, I actually worked with this gentleman over here, so to, to, I've taken longer contracts um, and gone into an office for contracts sometimes um, when I feel that vibe. It often reminds me why I'm a freelancer. <laughs> <laughs> Because you're like, oh, I need to do something that's not related to this, and I can't, because uh, I'm here for you. Um, or I can't get lunch with somebody I need to, or there's a great prospect that's happening and I can't follow it up right now because of this. Um, there's, I mean, there's so many benefits to things. I'm in a very lucky situation where I don't have to deal with healthcare stuff because it's all through my wife. Um, so that that is amazing. I mean, freelancing definitely has its benefits and it definitely has its downsides. Um, part of the reason why I started the happy hour was because I needed to talk to people more <laughs> um, and see the same faces occasionally. Um, you know, there's no water cooler chatter between you and the dog. Um, but I can, you know, take the dog for a walk at 1 p.m and go to the park and be like, hey, it's a really nice day, I'm gonna stay here for an hour instead of doing work right now and I'll just work later. Um, so there's, there's definitely trade-offs. Uh, one more in the back. Yeah, for Jeff, if that's okay. Go for it, I'll, I'll repeat. <laughs> we talked about uh, uh, quoting and estimates and that kind of thing. Is there any hard resources out there to get, you know, what rates are going to be competitive in the market, especially if you're going to subcontract? You know, what do you need to uh, what what do you need to know to hire a DBA to hire a backend developer that kind of thing? And in terms of rates, uh, in terms of rates, there's things like Glassdoor that give you an idea of salaries at different places. Um, that will give you a ballpark. You could break that down a little bit. Um, there's other things like Bonsai has a freelance calculator that you can put in different things. They don't have every position, but they might give you a benchmark. Um, asking around in the community can help a lot. Um, you know, people don't like to share their rates, but I don't see any problem with it most of the time because uh, it just gets you business because then people know how much to pay you. Um, yeah, there's some of that stuff. Um, also, like if you're subcontracting or hiring people, you can also just not say what you're gonna pay and say, tell me what your rate is. And you'd be surprised at the range that comes back to you sometimes. And sometimes you're like, you're either undervaluing yourself or you're really not good at your job. Um, and then, I mean, you meet all sorts of spectrum of things, but there's, I mean, I know a couple of freelancers that have very high rates because they're senior level people. They work three months out of the year and then like go to Peru for another nine months out of the year and, and do no work. Um, that's the life. I haven't achieved that yet. <laughs> um, one last one. That was my question too. Oh, your, same thing? Your thought process on how you determine your prices. Yeah, I mean, my prices have gone a little up over the years as I've gotten more experience and more confidence and more awareness to the market and what people charge. Um, that that has definitely helped me acclimate. I've also, there's certain, you know, like startups and stuff and work you really enjoy. I sometimes discount my rate based on the work itself and that I'm going to learn something. Like, to your question earlier, um, sometimes I'll be like, I don't know how to do that, I really want to know how to do that, and I will do that for you at a discount rate, just this section of work, or just this time period. Um, be very clear about how long that rate lasts, um, and when it goes up, because it will go up. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a 30 second one. Okay, cool. What, what's your rate? <laughs> What's my rate? Um, so generally these days for UX design when I'm doing web or mobile apps I'm charging $100 an hour. Um, depending on the work it can go up or down um, and depending on the contract length. So it's great to have a really high rate. Um, if you do that for only a week or two, you may, these 
decent amount of money, but if a contract comes in, like, um, I've done contracts as low as like $50 an hour that lasted six months. Um, I feel like I'm above that now, and I've done longer contracts at much higher rates. Um, so yeah, it all depends on where you are financially and what you can deal with too. Um, Cause you might need a thousand bucks this week to pay your rent. Um, and if somebody says it's a 10 hour job and you charge a hundred bucks an hour, you just fix that problem. So, yeah. I think that's it for now, guys. Um, so thank you for coming. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and pretty much every social media under at M Deucing. Um, you can also find me in Denver Devs. I host the Develop Happy Hour on Meetup. You can find me there every single month. This month for you people that are local, um, we have one tonight for part of the conference, but we're also doing a special one at Casa Bonita. We're doing a costume party at the end of the month. It's gonna be amazing. So check it out. Thanks a lot for coming.